Uh, good morning and welcome to the sixth and final lecture on discrete math. Uh, the topic, well, in a bit more general setting is called beyond NP completeness. Uh, we will start with some actual NP complete problems, but uh, uh, still discuss how we can go, say, in a sense, outside uh, the fact that they're actually NP and uh, NP hard and try to make it more say, tractable, more polynomial. And in the second half of this lecture, we shall uh, discuss uh, uh, something which is beyond actual decision problems. So uh, NP hardness as a notion corresponds only to decision problems, but uh, there are also problems of search, of counting, of uh, polynomial time delay and stuff like that, and we'll see how it will work. So, um, first thing we're going to uh, recall is the notion of Euler and uh, Hamiltonian path in graph. So, the definitions look similar. So an Euler path in a graph, well, the graph can be multigraph, there could be parallel edges, is a path which traverses each edge exactly once. And you remember this picture of Königsberg, where Euler tried to visit each bridge and do it exactly once. So here it is a path, so it's not obliged to finish at the same point where it started, but also there is a notion of Euler cycle. So Euler cycle and Euler path are actually quite close one to another, so we'll discuss them in parallel, and it actually doesn't matter much. So another notion is a Hamiltonian path, and it should visit each vertex exactly once. So here it's uh, actually not so important whether it is a multigraph or a graph, so it can include parallel edges, but uh, actually we could use only one of them, because we visit each vertex exactly once, and we cannot use the same, the parallel edge. And also, if we have loops, again, this is, um, it doesn't matter because we cannot use a loop. Otherwise, we visit this vertex twice. And by the way, in an Euler path also, if we have loops, uh, then we can always visit them. And so we can remove them. So uh, these two notions look quite similar. But there is a huge complexity gap. Finding an Euler path is polynomial. So the decision problem just relies on a simple criterion of uh, a graph being an Euler one. So there exists an Euler path if and only if uh, there are zero or two odd vertices and the graph is connected. So this is what we discussed at the practical classes. And uh, finding the Euler path, well, it's a bit harder, but it's also polynomial that is this greedy algorithm which builds this path and then augments it until it uh, becomes a real say, Euler path. It, the, the algorithm was uh, defined for an Euler cycle, but if you have two odd vertices, you will have an Euler path which is not a cycle, and it can be reduced to the notion of Euler cycle by just adding an extra edge between these two vertices. Then you will construct an Euler cycle in this say, extended graph, and we'll remove this new edge you will get an Euler path in the original graph, so it's the same. But for a Hamiltonian path, it's not the case, and the decision problem for existence of a Hamiltonian path in a graph is NP complete. So in this iteration of the course, we do not give a formal proof of that. Uh, there are some lecture notes on the web page in the archive, but also I will maybe post it tonight in the main uh, part for this year. So uh, the proof of NP completeness is quite standard. We provide a reduction from uh, three set to searching your Hamiltonian path. So for each formula in three CNF, well, actually it's important that it is in CNF, and it is in three CNF is not that important. For each such formula, we construct a graph with a specific sort of graph, which includes the Hamiltonian path, even though if the formula is satisfiable. So the satisfying assignment is somehow encoded as a Hamiltonian path there. So it's basically the same as we did say for a click or for independence that previous lecture. So the general idea was that we had to construct a specific sort of graph and the coloring of that graph, say three coloring, oh no, no, three coloring, the, uh, sorry, independent set. For three coloring, it's a different problem. It's also a path. So for independent set, 
an the graph had an independent set if and only if the Boolean formula was satisfiable. So the independent set somehow encoded the satisfying assignment. So the same happens here, but the construction is more involved. So it's just uh, combinatorically, it's more complicated, but uh, from the say point of view of ideas, absolutely the same. So no specific tricks are required here. And finding a Hamiltonian cycle, as we see, is in general hard, but finding all the cycle is easy. So sometimes we need finding Hamiltonian cycles, and we will see it in examples today, uh, real practical examples. And uh, the idea is that sometimes we can reduce the problem of finding a Hamiltonian cycle to the problem of finding an Euler cycle. Of course, such a reduction is not always possible. And the reason is that a uh, Hamiltonian cycle is NP-hard, and if we provide a reduction to an Euler cycle, to finding an Euler cycle, this will prove P equals NP, which is highly li likely not to be the case. But here, uh, sometimes it's possible. And uh, this is possible if a graph is a specific form, which is called a line graph. So for a graph, we can define a graph G, we can define another graph called, defined called L of G as follows. So uh, this is the original graph G, and we put, uh, we take edges of that graph and uh, call them vertices of the new graph like this. So, this. so the original graph is now gray and this black small vertices, these are new vertices of L of G. And we connect them if and only if the corresponding edges are incident, they have a common vertex. So just like that. I hope that I didn't miss anything. And this is a new graph, which is the line graph. And now if we have an Euler path in the original graph, if we manage to find such a path, of course it will be a Hamiltonian path in the new graph. Just by definition, because uh, if you have a path in, an, in G, then it will boil down to a path in L of G. Just you, you just take the order of the edges rather than the vertices in the path, and these edges will be indeed connected in L of G since they were incident in the, so they had common ends in the original graph G. So, and if you had an, a Hamiltonian path, so if you had an Euler path in the original graph here, then it will become a Hamiltonian path in the new graph, uh, because uh, you take old edges, they became vertices, and you visited each edge once, now we visit each vert vertex exactly once. This looks like, um, uh, well, reduction into the wrong direction, because uh, if we wish to construct an Euler path, we could use this to reduce it to a Hamiltonian path. But this is not what we really want, because constructing Euler path is easy, constructing Hamiltonian path is hard. So reducing Euler path to Hamiltonian path is meaningful. But nevertheless, uh, sometimes our graph happens to be a line graph for some other graph. And this will give us a backwards reduction. Unfortunately, this is a reduction which not, does not always work because uh, in L of G there could be a Hamiltonian cycle which is not in, induced by an Euler cycle in G. So here is an example. You see this graph. This is uh, just graph G. This graph does not have an Euler cycle, right? Because it's all the four vertices all are odd. But if we take this graph, which is uh, it's line graph, of course it will be Hamiltonian because it just looks like like a complete graph actually. Well, it's not complete, but you can just take the outer cycle and this will be Hamiltonian. So this is not exactly a reduction, but sometimes it helps. And in some practically important case, the representation of a given graph as a line graph allows efficient construction of Hamiltonian cycles. Let us give some examples. So yeah, the same works for directed graphs. Uh, just you add directions, and uh, again, a directed Euler path, it means that it should be a directed path, and it should traverse each edge exactly once, induce the directed Hamiltonian path in the line graph. Absolutely the same, just you add arrows. Um, so what is an example? So the genome and its fragments. So we're going to talk about some applications to the genomics, to science of uh, analyzing uh, genes of some species. Animals, 
live in object. So a genome is, uh, so genomics is something on the border of biology and computer science because, well, really, the, these are, what is a gene, say DNA? It's a, a say, polymer acid, a long line of uh, specific nucleotides, which are, can be of four types, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. So these are real, say, chemical molecules. So really exists in the, in, the, in the world, in the cells of all the living. But on the other side, uh, there are only four of them. So this DNA can be encoded just as a word in a four-letter alphabet. So it's exactly a discrete object. And uh, many problems which arise in what they call computational biology on the study of these genes, of uh, what they can have from that, is actually problems on words or on other discrete structures. And therefore, they are actually belong to computer science rather than to biology. So this is a small example. And let's consider the following model situation. Well, things like that happen in uh, real practice. Not exactly, but like that. So suppose that we don't know the genome as a whole. We can just see that uh, the experiment can give us fragments of length three, which we can take out from this long word and they're in random order because we don't know they, they, they are we cannot read say the dna exactly but we can using some uh well maybe chemical experiments understand that there is a subsequent of the form say gct so we know that and we want to restore the string actually it was the same as it on top so you can say a cta exists the act gcc so this encodes the string up but uh, in a random order, we don't know how to take them. So three is arbitrary. There could be more, and this will make our algorithms better. But three have, just comes from this well-known fact that triplets are uh, objects of three uh, nucleotides encode uh, one element of a protein, which gets constructed from the DNA. So knowing the triplets can be just allow to understand what proteins are going to be constructed. So uh, our goal is to reassemble the genome. And it's easy to see that reassembly corresponds to the Hamiltonian path in the so-called overlap graph. So in this graph, one triplet is connected to another. So vertices are these triplets. If uh, they have, they share the ending and starting two letters, like the CTA maps to TAG. So this means that the, in, in our genome, they should stand like that. Well, they could stand like that. because it's possible. And this is the, uh, the graph of our, and we can see that this is a Hamiltonian path. It should not be a cycle because this is just, uh, DNA is not cyclic, but it's a path. So you see that here you can say it's A, C, T, A, G, C, and so on and so forth. Then we reconstruct and we would use the reassembly problem for genomes to the Hamiltonian path problem. Well, which is not that good because the Hamiltonian path problem is NP hard, and therefore solving it is going to be just brute force searching, and I, possibly this could be done without any graph theoretic representation, just you can do brute force on your uh, genome itself. So uh, what can we do? It would be much better that if we could use the Euler path instead of Hamiltonian one. This will give us a good algorithm. And fortunately, it, it helps. So instead of the overlap graph, we consider uh, we consider it as a line graph. So uh, here is the vice versa translation, but it is dual. So we identify the vertices with the same say, pairs and two so now the vertices are pairs of nucleotides, and uh, here we connect them if there is one of the triplets in our database, which has, which, which the first pair is the first two letters, and the second pair is the last two letters, so the overlap on the middle one. And this is called the De Bruyne graph. And in the De Bruyne graph, there is an Euler cycle, Euler path, then it induces the Hamiltonian path in the original graph, 
and this solves the problem. And searching for all the paths is much easier. And therefore, we can do it like that. And there are two possible assemblies here. You can just read it from the graph. It's going to be all the paths. So each, actually, each edge here represents a triplet. So it's the same. So what is the main idea which can be taken from this consideration is that in this example, uh, understanding the inner structure of uh, the graph uh, helps to uh, get better al algorithmic solution. So uh, if compared to general Hamiltonian path problem, here we see that the graph is specific, so we can make it easy. And this is actually the point of learning all this theory of NP completeness, all these negative results, that seeing, uh, so you can, you usually you see a practical problem. You try to reduce it to something well known, but here you see that Hamilton, you can reduce it to a Hamiltonian path, which looks quite natural, but this is going to be NP hard, and so you stop. But there is a, another reduction to Euler path, which is algorithmic. And this De Bruyne graph is actually used in real world genome. So this is just one of today's uh, practical applications of this notion of graphs and algorithms on them. Now let's go back and recall the definition of the NP class, since now we go, want to go beyond decision problems. And today we shall use definition two with hints. So as you remember, NP comes in two equivalent definitions. So the first one, actually reflects the idea of n non-deterministic so it says that you take an algorithm well say a turing machine which runs non-deterministically so it can make non-deterministic choice and then we say it returns yes if and only if at least one of these trajectories of possible execution succeeds and returns yes another definition which is equivalent is with definition with hints so it says that a problem belongs to NP if it can be solved in polynomial time, but with some hint given. So in all our examples, these hints are also they are called witnesses. They were explicitly understandable. So say if we talk about SAT, then our hint is the satisfying assignment itself, right? If we talk about searching for a Hamiltonian path, then the hint is uh, the path. So if we're given the path, then we're, we can easily check it. If you say talk about coloring of graphs, the coloring itself is the hint. If you talk about uh, independent sets or cliques, again, this object is itself a hint. So NP can be ex explained in the following way. You, if you are given the sort of answer, uh, you can check it easily. But searching for the answer could be hard. So the formal definition is as follows. So you say that the result is yes. So the object X belongs to this set. So it problems. This, the decision problem is solved positively, if and only if there exists a y such that r of x y is one, and r should be a polynomially decidable predicate. So this is uh, so what the algorithm does. It should somehow guess this witness y, the hint, and then check it in polynomial time whether it actually is the correct hint. So r should be computable in polynomial time, and there is one more condition that the length of y should be so q is also a polynomial, and the length of y should be not greater than q of x. Uh, this means that the hint itself should not be so long, because otherwise we can just find out a very big hint, and r will be polynomial. But or an equivalent formulation could be as follows: the execution time for r should be polynomial, but with respect to the length of x, not x and y, because otherwise we could just take a very long hint. And so the length of hint should be also small. And we can also check this inside R. So we can say that R should not accept very long hint. Although it's just easier to understand like that. And of course, this is equivalent to definition one, because we can guess the hint in uh, polynomial, by non deterministic polynomial algorithm. And vice versa, we can say that if we have a non deterministic execution, then these non deterministic choices, they could be governed by a hint. So an example so far, yes, it's a fine assignment, a typical example of a hint. And the hint is given by someone who is our friend. So 
that that guy wants us to solve the problem. So the, the, this uh, say person who gives this hint will try his best to provide us the best hint possible. So if a good hint exists such that r of x y equals one, then uh, uh, this hint will be given to us. One of these ones. Let's say. If such a hint does not exist, then that guy will give us something random and we'll fail. But then we'll fail for any hint. It's called angelic choice, I remember. And an NP decision problem is exactly as defined here. So a decision problem says that whether there exists such Y, which we now call witness, that uh, we get one. So a decision problem returns a Boolean value, either true or false. For example, there's a satisfying assignment for a formula. Uh, if it exists, then uh, we should answer yes. Formula is satisfied. We're not obliged to return this assignment itself. We could also ask for all witnesses, and we know that uh, possibly. So this is, uh, in general, impossible to solve in polynomial time, just because the number of these, wi these correct witnesses is going to be. Uh, it could be exponential, but there are algorithms with polynomial delay. So we can solve it in. Uh, say polynomial time in an interactive sense. So an easier problem is a search problem. It should yield one witness or say no. So if the answer is no, uh, no witnesses, no say satisfying assignments. But if yes, then it should return at least one of them. And there is the counting problem which we'll discuss today, how to yield the number of witnesses. And the counting problem could appear to be harder. Because what happens here? Uh, suppose you know how to answer the decision problem. So you know whether this is zero or not. Suppose you know how to solve the search problem. You can uh, find one witness. Even, you, even if you can uh, make an algorithm with polynomial delay, you can yield all of them, but this will require exponential time, unconditionally. So uh, how can you count them? If you try to yield all of them, you'll get exponential time. But the result of counting, well, it's a number. This number could be exponential, but an exponential number could be yielded in polynomial time, right? Because what is the length of the output if you output a number? It's roughly speaking the logarithm of this number, right? The number of digits in its say, binary or decimal representation. So you can print out a number which is very big in a reasonable time. So it's even if you say have a say satisfiable Boolean formula, and the whole say half of the assignment satisfied, so it's two to the power of n minus one. If you calculate this, you can show it in polynomial time. So a priori, the decision problem is of course the easiest one. If you know how to solve any of these guys of below the decision problem, you know how to solve the decision problem. So if you can count, you can just compare the result with zero. If you can yield at least one witness, you just ask for this witness and the algorithm explicitly says no, and this is the answer no to the decision problem, or it says yes, and it yields some extra information which we can just forget about. And a polynomial delay is the same. So we start the algorithm, and if actually the decision problem answers no, the algorithm will work in polynomial time, yield nothing and stop. Then we answer no. If this algorithm's polynomial delay yields at least one witness, again we stop and say yes. So the decision problem is the easiest one. However, the search problems are not harder than the decision ones in general. So namely, if p equals np, then any search problem is also solvable in polynomial time. Uh, so this can be done, for example, for SAT, and we, I think at the last practical class we have discussed this dichotomy method. So how do you uh, uh, solve the search problem for SAT using the decision problem? First, you decide whether there exists a satisfying assignment. Then you do the dichotomy. You say, okay, I put the first value to zero, check for satisfiability. If it's not satisfiable, I will put the first value to one. If, if this is, I put it to zero, then check the second value, and then you will get a polynomial time algorithm. So, but this happens if P equals NP. Uh, sometimes, however, the search problem could be harder, and we'll see it in this example. 
because uh, sometimes the search problem is not always reduced to the same decision problem. So it can be always reduced to deciding set because searching for a witness e here, Cook Levin, therefore searching for a witness is the same as searching for a satisfying assignment of some Boolean formula, right? As we know. Uh, so if we can solve SAT in polynomial time, you can solve any search problem in polynomial time. But suppose you have some search problem for which the decision problem is not in P hard. It's not in P complete. P could be not equal to NP, but uh, the, the search problem could be hard. And let's see the example. So suppose you have the following relation. You take Y, which is not just, just a satisfying assignment, which is a, a pair. And for this pair, we require the following. So either the first element is a satisfying assignment for phi, or the second element is a satisfying assignment for not phi. So of course, both conditions could not hold. So either A is a good object and it satisfies phi, or B is a good object and it falsifies phi. Of course, this couldn't happen at the same time. So if A is a satisfying assignment, B is arbitrary. And if B is a falsifying assignment, then A is arbitrary. Okay, so uh, the decision problem here is trivial, right? Because any formula is either satisfiable or falsifiable. Therefore, for it, uh, so the formula exists either satisfying assignment or a falsifying assignment. No, no, it, it could be both, of course, because phi and not phi could be satisfiable at the same time. But at least one exists. But the search problem is equivalent for the one for set or roughly equivalent, because suppose our formula is satisfiable, or suppose our formula is a tautology, then you cannot yield a, uh, so then you, yielding that is a, exactly uh, answer as it is a tautology, because if you yield that, then this uh, object has more information. It also has the information which of these two is okay, and so you can falsify that. So this is hard, but the decision problem here is trivial. So the search problem could be harder, but in most situations it can be reduced to the search problem, to the decision problem. So again, for uh, uh, polynomial delay, it's usually basically the same in complexity as search. So these problems, usually they are hard. So if the original problem is NP hard, these guys are also hard. If the original problem is polynomially solvable, usually these problems are also polynomially solvable, but uh, module of such uh, strange examples as we can see here. So sometimes the decision problem is just trivial for some easy reason, but the uh, say search problem is hard. But here we see that it actually includes an NP hard problem inside. Now what about counting problem? So sharp P, it's, uh, this uh, symbol is called sharp, and it stands for the notion of number, the total number of uh, 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 witnesses, and uh, this is uh, the class of counting problems corresponding to NP decision problems. So, uh, and counting problems can be actually harder than the corresponding decision one. And we'll see the following. Well, we'll not prove this, we'll prove as a simpler fact, but this is a classical example that you have two set. So, Decision problem for two set is solvable in polynomial time, right? You have a two CNF, and this was your homework number one that you can apply resolutions and get the result. And two set is not solvable in polynomial time unless P equals NP. Uh, not, not to say a counting two set. So the question is you have a two CNF, you want to ask how many satisfying assignments are there. And this is uh, not polynomial unless P equals NP. So how to prove that? How to prove such sort of results? You know that if you uh, take just to set as a decision problem, this will not give you the good answer because it will polynomially decidable. But how can you capture this counting? And notice that our uh, computational complexity conjecture here is the same. So the conjecture here is about P and NP, so about decision classes. But the, the result is about counting class, counting problems. And in order to prove theorems like this, one has to develop a parallel theory of sharp P completeness. What are hard problems in the class of sharp P? 
And this will be done by reduction of counting problems to each other. So again, this is called polynomial counting reduction. It reduces one counting problem to another. And if, unlike uh, M reduction, which works for uh, uh, decision problems, the counting reduction uh, consists of two functions, F and N and G. So recall what is the counting problem. So you have R, some R, and uh, you say that the counting of A is the counting of number of Y's which satisfy this relation R is X, and R is polynomial checkpoint. For B, there will be some other R prime instead of R. So formally, the, uh, in the format, in the type, the mm, counting problem inputs a word encoded in our alphabet. So this word could be, say, Boolean formula, graph, this code, just any finite object, actually. And it returns a natural number. And natural numbers could also include zero. In logic and computer science, natural numbers usually include zero. So, because the count can be zero. So, uh, now we have the result, and the result is not just zero or one, it is number. And now we say that uh, A is reducible to B if we can do the following. We take the input, we transform it somehow into f of x polynomially, then we count the result for B, and then we can apply also a function which does something on the counts. So this function is just a function of natural numbers, g. It's here, right? And this is indeed a reduction, because if we can solve b somehow, then we can solve the counting problem for a. And this problem will be solved as follows. We take x, we apply f, then we apply this oracle, this black box for counting the number of witnesses for b, and then we go backwards by applying g. So for this is a difference from the theory of NP completeness, because if we try to, we could apply such sort of a definition for NP class also. But this will capture both NP and co-NP, right? Because what, what will happen then? Suppose we can apply a function after calling the oracle in the notion of NP. This would, what, what is the answer of the oracle? It's zero or one. And what function could we apply? We could either uh, take this answer or uh, swap zeros and ones, apply the negation. Applying the negation moves from P to co and P. So, and therefore here we'll see how it works in the counting. For counting, we can apply the result. So we should, we could, we, we are not possible, needed, we are not required to keep the same answer. And there is a theory of an analogous to NP completeness. So a counting problem is sharp P complete. If any other problem is sharp P is counting reducible to it. And now we can develop a theory of sharp P complete problems which is parallel to the theory of NP complete problems. And the counting reduction of a specific kind is called parsimonious uh, if G is the identity function. So it means that this specific kind of M reduction, which are, uh, so in particular G of zero is zero. So this also a reduction on our decision problems. And G of not zero is not zero. So it conveys the answer of the decision problem, but also parsimonious reductions, they form a, a smaller class than just M reductions because they should keep the number of witnesses. So uh, for example, our reduction for uh, independent set, they were not parsimonious because uh, for each satisfying assignment, there could be a, a different coloring of the graph or different independent sets. But it's nice that the reductions in Kuklevin's theorem are parsimonious. So each trajectory of the non-deterministic run, so each value of the hint, is represented by exactly one satisfying assignment. So recall how Kuklevin was proved. We said that, okay, we have a, a Turing machine, a non-deterministic Turing machine, on a given input. We take its complete protocol of its execution, it's polynomial size because we have polynomial bounds of memory and uh, length of execution. And uh, now we encoded that the, f the fact that this, this is a correct uh, <coughs> protocol was encoded by a Boolean formula. And each correct protocol of execution of a Turing machine corresponded to exactly one correct, uh, exactly one satisfying assignment of this formula. So this meant that each uh, 
non-deterministic run or each value of the hint y correspond to exactly one um, exactly one satisfying assignment for this formula. So this means that uh, Cook Levin reduction is parsimonious, and thus we get the count inversion of Cook Levin that uh, the count inversion of set is also sharp P complete. Uh, well, here is the, the answer. Yes. So the sequence of configurations or the protocol is encoded by a binary matrix, and this binary matrix is a satisfying assignment for our formula if and only if this matrix indeed represents the correct protocol of successful execution. Sorry. This is the, uh, just a recall of what happened in Cook Levin's theorem. So, how this formula is constructed, it says that the first row should represent the configuration of with X on tape. So, this is the input configuration. Each next row is obtained from the previous one by applying one of the rules of the machine. The machine is non deterministic, so there could be arbitrary choice, and therefore, there could be many satisfying assignments. But uh, each satisfying assignment, again, yeah, and the last row should represent the correct answer. Yeah. Uh, each satisfying assignment of this formula constructed in the following way is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the... So, in a sense, parsimonious reductions then can be called one-one reduction, and M reduction will many one, because there there could be, say, not the, uh, the numbers could be messed up. As always, with the formula. So now we, we can say also the same for three CNFs. So that we know that three sat is reducible to three sets, that for each formula you can construct an equisatisfiable three CNF, right? By Satan trick. So this is not equivalent formula, but it's equisatisfiable. And we'll see that uh, this is actually um, that they are parsimonious in the sense that a satisfying assignment of the original formula is in one-to-one -one, satisfying assignments of the original formula are in one-to-one -one correspondence with satisfying assignments of the Satan version, Satanized version. So you can construct an satisfiable. And the main idea is that these you have these new values, variables Ti, and they're restored uniquely. So let's see it here. So this is just I will skip that lack of time and we'll go here. So this is an example. And we replace it with the following formula. And actually, this formula is just equivalent to a 3CNF, as we know, we can see by these equivalences to this. So this formula, this colorful formula here, is equivalent to the colorful formula here. So they have the same set of satisfying assignments. And now what happens if we, if we take a satisfying assignment of the original formula? From the satisfying assignment, you can uniquely take, uh, uniquely uh, read the values of T1, T2, T3, T4 because they're just given in this formula. All these equivalences should hold, and therefore they should be, uh, they, they are fixed. So each satisfying assignment of the original formula yields exactly one satisfying assignment of the new formula, and other way around. If you have a satisfying assignment of this, you just take its subset on PQR and get a satisfying assignment of the original formula. So in both directions, state and reductions are parsimonious. And therefore, we get the following result. The uh, counting problem for three sat is also sharp P complete. So, well, this is, uh, in a sense, not surprising. And uh, as we can see here, using only parsimonious reductions actually is meaningless. So we can prove which something which looks different from NP completeness. It's sharp P completeness. So there are reductions on counting problems, the parallel theory of uh, reductions. And by the way, this parsim we have to also to uh, keep track of this parsimonicity of our reductions, which is not always trivial. Say for graph problems, it's usually not the case, and we have to make something, some extra tricks to make it work, because otherwise you can just sometimes you have several graph constructions represent the same satisfying assignment in three sides or something like that. But from a practical point of view, if you use only parsimonious reductions, then uh, this is uh, useless. Because what, what will happen? Uh, suppose you have a problem A, which is proved to be sharp P complete by only parsimonious reductions. 
each parsimonious reduction induces a, an M reduction. So if we uh, move from counting problems to decision problems, then we'll see that the corresponding decision problem, the decision variant for A, is NP complete by the same sequence of reduction. And this will say, OK, we have an NP complete problem, which is, uh, well, well, an NP complete problem, even in its, in its decision variant. We suppose that P is not equal to NP, therefore the decision variant is already hard, but the counting variant is indeed harder. So the only what question? So the only possible situation where this could be useful is the strange case where sharp P is not polynomial and P equals NP. This could be the case that P equals NP. This means that you can solve any NP problems in polynomial time, any decision problem, but sharp P could be theoretically speaking harder. But this is a very strange situation. So if P is not equal to NP, then as a theory of NP hardness is already sufficient to prove hardness of counting problems which are associated to NP hard problems, like say three sets. So for three set, we already know that it is hard even in the decision variant, then indeed it is hard in the counting variant. And uh, yes, we know that even A is not polynomial solver. What to say about stuff? But using the more general counting reduction that's not parsimonious and which makes something with the counting at the end would give interesting results. And the interesting includes, cases include situations when the decision problem is polynomially decidable, but the counting problem is hard. So hard means it is sharp P hard. So again, uh, not solvable unless P equals NP. We'll see that. And the famous example is two set. We know it is in SP. We should not give the proof of the sharp P completeness. It's technically hard, but uh, you can see it in these uh, papers. We'll talk a bit about that in the end. So what happens next? Mm. So we know that it is sharp P hard. And now we can go for the following. So it's sharp P hard. What does it mean? It means that any sharp P problem can be polynomially reduced to this counting problem, right? Sharp two set. In particular, sharp three set is reducible to sharp two set, right? Then suppose that sharp two set is polynomially time solvable. Then sharp three set is going to be polynomially time solvable, right? But then the decision problem for three set will go into polynomial time solvable, which contradicts P is not equal to NP. So you see that the theory of sharp P hardness allows the usage of the same complexity conjectures in order to establish hardness of some uh, of some results. So uh, okay. We shall not consider this. Consider an easy example, which is actually um, understandable. DNF set versus counting version of DNF set. So on the left hand side, you are given a, your input is a DNF. You are given a formula in disjunctive normal form. And on the left hand side, you are asking whether this formula is satisfied or there exists at least one satisfying assignment. On the other side, you ask for the number of these assignments. So easily, as a decision problem, DNF set belongs to P. The proof here is uh, easy because if you have a DNF as a big disjunction, satisfying this big disjunction is just satisfying one of its clauses, right? And how can you satisfy a clause? The clause is a conjunction of literals. It's satisfiable if and only if it just does not include contradictions. Yeah, I'm sorry, I have a question about this, okay. about satisfying a DNF. But what if... Uh, only the last clause of DNF is satisfying, satisfiable. Okay. So we have to um, we have to check all the clauses, and the last one could be satisfiable or could be not. So it's still N P. No. No, no. Uh, the In input the is the DNF, right? Yeah. And therefore, your algorithm is just linear in the length of the input. So your parameter is not the number of variables, it's the oh, size yeah. of the input. Right, right. 
Sometimes yeah, it's, it's an important thing that, yes, you will have, so you traverse the DNF, you check each clause, and if one of these is satisfiable, and this is trivially checkable, you will say yes. If all of them are contradictory, you yield no. So what is the complexity of this algorithm? It's the, uh, virtually it's the size of the DNF, right? The number of clauses. So each step takes clause. And this is not uh, NP, it's P because it's linear just with respect to the size of the input. So, yes, the, the good question was the size of the input is the size of the DNF, it's not the number of uh, number of values or variables. Or like that. So, uh, for CNF, this is not the case, because uh, well, what can you do with the CNF? You can, for example, apply resolutions, right? But when you apply resolutions, uh, you can get exponential blow up. The saturated CNF could be exponentially bigger than the uh, we had such examples in the practical class, it could be exponentially bigger than the original sin. And therefore, this is the exponential blow up. And here, this is a polynomial. And it's, it belongs to P. However, the following reduction can reduce CNF set to DNF set. So how does it work? So suppose phi is the number of, uh, is the input. So phi is a CNF. And k is the number of variables, and n is going to be our answer. So if we know the number of satisfying assignments for the negation of phi, how can we compute the number of uh, satisfying assignments for phi? So again, what is the total number of possible assignments for, for k variables? Each variable has either 0 or 1, they're independent, so 2 to the power of k, right? So each assignment either satisfies phi or not phi, right? Because, well, tertum non datum, it's to the middle. Uh, so each assignment, they form two classes. Some assignments satisfy phi, others satisfy not phi. The total number is 2 to the power of k. Therefore, if there are n assignments for phi, they're 2 to the power of k minus n assignments for not phi, and vice versa. And now we can see the following. You take phi, and you try to satisfy, you count the number of assignments for not phi, and then you just subtract it from 2 to the power of k. And here I say this DNF of not phi. So phi is in, S, in CNF. If you negate it, you will get a formula which is a negation of a CNF. But morally, this formula is actually a DNF due to just the following uh, idea that, just to De Morgan, if you take a big negation over a CNF, a CNF is a big conjunction of some clauses, you take the big negation, by De Morgan it transforms to disjunction of negation of the clauses, right? And then each clause is a disjunction, and again when it's negated it transforms to a conjunction. So if you have a CNF and you negate it, you can easily transform it into an equivalent CNF, a DNF. So negations of CNFs are virtually uh, close to DNF, and vice versa. And this translation into DNF, so this function DNF, it takes a, a formula and transforms it into equivalent DNF. In general, it's very hard. But in this case, it's polynomial, if phi was a CNF. And this DNF of not phi is, of course, equivalent to not phi, and it has the same satisfying assignment. And so this reduction reduces CNF sat to DNF sat in its counting version. So, of course, for decision problems, no such trick is possible. Because here we essentially need the information of the number of assignments. Because if we just know that the DNF was satisfiable, so they would know that the negation is satisfiable, it's a DNF. It does not mean that our formula is not satisfiable, because it could be the case that both phi and not phi are satisfiable just by different assignments. And so if we can solve a decision problem for DNF, this could not help us to solve the decision problem for CNF. But if you have a counting version, you can have this reduction. It's not parsimonious, of course, because it flips to bar k uh, the, 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 the count. So it takes the answer, which is a natural number, and it performs like some operation. This G of n is polynomial. So it looks like there is a scary exponential there, 
but this is operation on natural numbers. It's not operation on, say, you don't say have two power of k real, say, objects and do something with them. You just take the number two power of k and subtract the number n. So n is not greater than two power k, of course, always. And two power of k requires, say, k plus one binary digits for representation, right? In binary notation, it's just one and k zeros. So it's polynomial. And computing this subtraction is also polynomial by standard algorithm. So operations on natural numbers, uh, when you operate on natural numbers, uh, and talking about exponentiality or polynomiality, you should always, uh, say, mm, consider uh, the logarithm of the length of the integer. So, of course, you never keep your numbers in unary form. You keep the same binary or decimal or something. So this is the explanation what I said just now. So indeed, the set of satisfying assignments for formula is a complement for that of mod phi. So if formula is in C and F, then the negation is easily transformable to a DNF. And thus you get this reduction. And since the left one is sharp P hard, then the right one is also. So for the left one, it's done by uh, Kuklevin and Tatum transformation. We get even three CNF, but now it's our forest sufficient just to have CNF. And a corollary that if P is not equal to NP, polynomial is solvable. The decision problem is, but uh, counting is not. Otherwise, so would be a counting problem for T CNF set, and therefore a decision problem for CNF set, which would imply that P equals NP. So, um, this is an easy example of a uh, uh, sharp p-hard problem. On this example, we see that counting is um, could be harder than just the decision. Also, it's a funny thing uh, that uh, <laughs> beyond, say, counting problem, there is a problem which looks easier, which is the parity problem. So the parity problem is the uh, question whether uh, the number of uh, assignments is odd or even. The, the parity problem appears to be uh, extremely hard. Uh, it's strange because it's, it looks like a decision problem. Its result is uh, just uh, a binary uh, object. It's true or false. But nevertheless, zero, one, even or odd. But nevertheless, in, it happens to be some, in most times, in most cases, as hard as the counting one, but we leave this outside our scope. So we see that there's easy examples that uh, CNF's counting problem could be hard. And now, uh, well, counting problems are not so easy to motivate um, as, say, uh, search problems or decision problems. So why in the world should we wish to count for uh, satisfying assignments? Not to yield them all, not to try to find one of them, but just to count or answer for parity or something like that. So um, while searching for the usage of sharp p hard things in uh, data analysis, I came across one example. Well, the example itself is quite involved, so I will just give some ideas behind that, and this will be enough for us. But uh, if you wish to read more, I will just email me, and I will give you the literature. So unfortunately, with the last lecture now, and uh, uh, this will require some knowledge of probability theory. So it will be some um, thing on randomized things and graphs, and we'll uh, see it here. So now let's uh, see. So the example will be from a completely different area. So this will be a sharp p complete problem, which from the first glance has nothing to do with counting. And we'll a problem of permanent. So let's first recall the well-known notion of linear algebra, which, of course, all of you know, it's all people who do say machine learning, they all have to know linear algebra. So determinant of a matrix. This is the formal definition. It looks a bit scary. So uh, you take a matrix, so n times a matrix. As you know, it is the AIG, so this uh, element is of IG. And this is the determinant, which is a sum of these products. So how are these products constructed? You should take elements of this matrix so that from each row and from each column you take exactly one element. And this is done by the following idea. I take 
from each row I take one element, and the number of the column is the value of a transposition of these values from 1 to n. So this sum is actually exponential. It's more than exponential because there's n factorial ways of uh, uh, taking these elements. And moreover, there is a sign, which is the sign of the transposition. Algebra. So some of them are taken with uh, sign plus, some of them are taken with the sign minus. And this is widely used. So you can count volume of some uh, object in the space using this thing you is used for solving linear equations and many, many other things. Useful notion of linear algebra. And fortunately, there exists fast algorithm for computing the determinant. Of course, not by definition. If you try to compute it by definition, you will exponentially many elements there. But there is a Gaussian elimination or Gaussian diagonalization by um, uh, some transformations of the matrix, which somehow keep it equivalent to the original one, say it has the same determinant, and then it just get diagonalized. And in the diagonal matrix, the only non-zero element in this sum is going to be the diagonal, because other ones they could go, so they could take things which are beyond the diagonal. Or even you can make it a, not diagonal, but tri triagonalization. You can make it an upper triagonal matrix. So be below the diagonal, you will get only zeros. And the determinant will be computed easily. It's, well, recall of the basics of math. Any bachelor course in math, you will do that. Um, in the definition of determinant, products are taken with different signs. So for example, we have three by three matrix. And I represented these uh, elements as uh, dots. So with the sign plus, I take the following. A, so on the diagonal, A11, A22, A33. And these triangles. So A13, A21, A32. And the other triangle. These are taken with sign plus, and these are taken with sign minus. So three with plus and three with minus. We'll, it will sum it up, and you will get the determinant. What if we uh, remove the signs and just sum them all up without minus one? This will give us the notion of permanent, much like a determinant, but without signs. So permanent, well, uh, in algebra, I think it's not so well known and not so well used as uh, the determinant, but it's also used in uh, ap application of linear algebra to data analysis. So there is one example. I will just maybe now show you uh, some uh, part of a grasp of a textbook where you will see this application. Uh, here you will you see th this discusses mark of random fields. So a mark of random field is defined as follows. You have a graph and uh, you uh, consider some, say, uh, uh, random uh, values in the vertices. And these random values are independent if, uh, should be independent if these two are not connected. So all the dependencies are only licensed by connections in the graph. So say in the clique, they could be all dependent and stuff like that. And uh, there is a problem which is naturally arises that, uh, well, here you have this Hammersley Clifford theorem that uh, there is some property of the graph, which is this independent property and undirected blah, 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 uh, per maximal clique. If uh, the following holds, uh, so there's some formula and, uh, well, Again, for details, we don't have time, but the idea is that here you will have some what's called normalizing constant. You will have to di divide this by some value, and this is done in order to this be a real probability. So probability should be between 0 and 1, and this product can be beyond somehow, and therefore you should divide it by uh, the, this guy. And you see here exactly you will have a permanent of a matrix. If this is a finite one, then this is going to be this product over transpositions, and here is the sum. So uh, this comp happens to be important in many cases. Um, again, for details, please email me. I will shoot them to you. Um, but this, yeah, this is the example. However, 
if you try to compute the permanent by definition, uh, then you will, of course, get to exponential run. And if you need to compute that, so I will maybe say spoiler now what happens in reality, in real, say, industrial applications, they try somehow to replace exact computation of the permanent with uh, uh, approximation computation because they have to do it polynomially. So, of course, the first question which can arise here is the natural algebraic question. Maybe the permanent looks like a determinant. Maybe there exist algorithms like Gaussian uh, diagonalization. Maybe you can do something with the matrix and compute the permanent in a better way. Unfortunately, the Gauss transformations uh, spoil the permanent. So if you apply Gauss transformation to a matrix, you can easily see that the permanent will modify. And this is due to the fact that in the determinant, these clever uh, signs, they make these uh, the effect of the Gauss and transformations cancel, in a sense. So. Uh, Gaussian transformation, they exactly transform the elements of the matrix, but in such a way that uh, the, their impact on the plus part of the determinant and on the minus size of the determinant, they compensate on the, each other. Uh, but uh, uh, this is not the case for the permanent. For the permanent is all is added, and if you apply Gauss transformations, you will, uh, at some point, you will just uh, get the, not the same value. But maybe there could be some other transformations or some other ways of computing this. And well, no. I like the determinants. There is probably no fast algorithm. So here we came across a problem which we didn't come across before. So what? What? There are actually many uh, tricky things lying under such possibly, well, probably easy question. What are the tricks? So first one is that uh, now uh, our uh, data is, well, what is a matrix? A matrix includes numbers, right? Numbers, in by default, they are real numbers. So from a computing point of view, they are, say, infinite objects. What, what can we do with them? Well, we have to approximate them. But then there is a huge uh, literature in uh, numeric analysis that if you approximate, you can fail just because your uh, precision could uh, lower down you during computation and stuff like that. OK, we can uh, reduce it to an easier problem of uh, uh, doing say, it only on uh, rational numbers. This will make our question at least algorithmically well posed that if our matrix includes only rational numbers, then counting is determinant or permanent is a real, is a normal algorithm which can be deemed to be, say, polynomial in a sense or something like that. But this is not a problem of a type we have uh, already considered. So it's not a decision problem, and it's not a formally speaking accounting problem because, well, its result is a rational number, not a natural number. And also it's not a search problem, so it's an really computing the function. But the theory of sharp p-hardness uh, is going to help us here. Because we can consider a very specific version of computing the permanent, show that this is actually a variant of a counting problem, and then see that it is uh, uh, hard. And therefore, if this specific case is hard, then the global problem is also going to be hard. Not solvable in polynomial time unless p equals n p. Suppose that all the elements are zeros and ones, and we compute the permanent. So, yeah, the permanent is computed using real product and sum, not say Boolean operations. So, what happens here? It's now a counting problem. In the definition here of the permanent, we have a sum of some products, right? And uh, each product is non zero if and only if all of these elements are non zero, right? And therefore, they should be one because they're only zeros and ones. So actually, this sum is just the number of non-zero elements in it. So it's the number of these transpositions or these permutations which make this one, so which don't take any zero. And this is a counting problem. The counting problem. The decision problem here is that the permanent is greater than zero, is easily polynomial. It reduces to finding a perfect matching in a bipartite graph. So this, we will discuss this in the practical class. Maybe with Jakob, we discussed it last time. 
um, what is the perfect matching. So you have a bipartite graph. You have two parts in the graph. And in the bipartite, so let me maybe open some other window for. So here we see a bipartite graph. And these red lines, they show the perfect matching. So this means that each element here is matched with one element here. And uh, also there are other edges. So uh, what is a, a bipartite graph in this situation? We just take rows, columns. So rows, rows are vertices of one sort, columns are vertices of another sort. And we say that they're connected if on the intersection we have one. Not connected if zero. And so searching for uh, at least one permutation which uh, makes uh, the product one, so all non zeros, it's the same as searching for perfect matching in such a graph. It's just equivalent. So, um, okay. Uh, but the counting problem is hard. And this was proved by Leslie Vanan in uh, 1979. Ben Doran Kalevi, I already there was this uh, reference here. They gave a simpler proof. Zero one permanent is sharply complete. So it's beyond our course, but just as to know that uh, zero one permanent, so this is the counting a permanent over a zero and one, it's a version of counting problem, you have to just to count something, and this is sharp p hard. And therefore, counting the permanent exactly, unless p equals np, is a hard problem. So this is how these theories of, uh, say, uh, hardness of problems in discrete mathematics, how these theories work in absolutely different environments. In linear algebra and even analysis also help to prove hardness of some algorithmic problems. And actually, this problem is parsimoniously reducible to, uh, to SAT. Uh, actually, via all these, uh, it's reducible via this uh, uh, perfect matching. That is, this can be reduced to perfect matching in its counting variant, and perfect matching can be encoded into SAT. You can see this easily. And so the that is also sharply hard. So, OK. Uh, at this point, uh, we um, have finished the material which uh, was supposed to be for the lectures. And uh, now uh, let me just uh, say some final remarks. So uh, in this course, we have uh, discussed actually two families of discrete objects. So the first one is uh, Boolean formulae and satisfying assignments for them. The second one is graphs and stuff connected to them. So uh, we have discussed the easiest, started with the easiest, uh, say, uh, family of algorithmic problems, which are decision problems, and shown that, well, unfortunately, under certain uh, satisfying, under certain uh, complexity conditions, like P is not equal to NP, we will have uh, some problems which cannot be solved, which are not the computationally tractable, which cannot be solved in reasonable time. And the notion of reasonable and tractable time is uh, declared to be polynomial time, which is uh, actually quite a coarse approximation of uh, what is really fast, because the polynomial power, I don't know, degree, say 100, is not so fast. But it's robust because it's independent from the computation uh, model. So for graphs, we also prove the NP hardness results, and this lecture goes beyond uh, decision problems, beyond NP, and discusses, say, counting problems, and also the connection to, say, real, in a sense, counting in uh, computational maths, and also shows that these results can be used there. So um, this is uh, basically the end of the lecture course. So thank you for listening. And now some uh, practical uh, things. So, uh, first of all, um, the, for the home assignment number two, the deadline was extended till Friday, anywhere on Earth, due to some uh, bugs which were uh, fi fixed in the testing. So, uh, the old tests for homework number three, or three, so for homework three, yeah. so they were just um, dysfunctional and always returned yes. 
and therefore uh, please check once more on GitHub and if the tests now fail, then please resubmit. Without, of course, any minuses, this is my fault, so this is your, you can just do it. Uh, so, uh, uh -huh. no, 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 if, you know, if, if the solution already passes the tests, the new tests, then you are fine. You, you just go on GitHub and see if you have this green tick there, then you are fine, then your solution is okay. But if you see that the new tests fail your solution, you have the opportunity to fix it yourself. If, if that only if the tests now fail, because this means that the solution was wrong, but uh, the tests just accepted because the test was bad. So this is you just first, please just uh, check the uh, whether it is okay right now. So if you solve the problem correctly, then the new test should pass. I updated the test in all the repositories, so this should work. Um, so that means that your uh, grading table will be finalized on Saturday. Um, so basically, tonight I will put the grades for homework number three, which are already okay, but you have the opportunity to make it better. So, uh, and the grading table is available, the link is on team. So next week, we're going to have the final exam. Uh, the final exam will be also sort of take home one because there are people who are not here in Moscow and all people should be in equal conditions. And also, I don't want to come to the university once more just for sitting here and watching you pass the exam. So, uh, uh, you in your timetable, you will see the official time frame for the exam. Um, for convenience of the people who are in different time zones, this time frame will be extended. So, uh, the uh, problems for the tasks for the final exam will be published online, and I will give the link on Teams, and you will see it on the course's webpage. In the middle of the day, on uh, so the, the exam will be next Wednesday, just in a week, official exam. But the tasks will be published online and given to you on uh, in the middle of the day, Moscow time, on uh, Tuesday. So you will have 24 hours for doing that. It does not mean that the exam is so hard that you will need actually 24 hours. You will need much less. It's like for three hours of uh, thinking. But uh, this is done just to accommodate all possible time zones. So just complete day cycle. Each of you could, so for people sitting physically here or listening for me today, they will probably, it will be easier for them to pass it in the uh, evening on Tuesday or in the morning on or Wednesday. But for people who will watch this asynchronously, they could do it, say, well, in Moscow, the late night or something like that. So all for your convenience. And uh, the, it will stop in the middle of the day and next Wednesday. So this, the, 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 this will be full strict deadline. By this time, the grades for the home assignments will be finalized already. And uh, then uh, in the evening of uh, Wednesday, I will grade everything and uh, put it on the uh, grading sheet. And uh, afternoon Thursday, I submit everything to study office, everything finalizes. So uh, after the exam in the evening, please look up in the uh, grading table. If you feel that uh, your grades are unfair, then just report to me. I will try to, uh, to answer. OK, so this basically all. If any questions, please ask now on Teams or physically. Спарович, можно вопрос по поводу вот формата экзамена? Я правильно понимаю, что он будет похож на первую домашку? То есть там просто будет ряд номеров? The exam is going to be written theoretical exam, so no programming, nothing like that. But unlike homework number two, there some of the tasks will be like uh, theoretical questions. So. Uh, if, if even homework two, your questions were like solve a problem, get an answer. Here there could be questions, well, not exactly like say define the notion of NP hardness. Well, because this is you can just Google that and well, it's meaningless. But uh, something like questions uh, related to the theoretical course. Some of them say three or two out of ten will like that. Uh, you can, I, I think on the web page, there is the old, the previous year one, and you, you can consult it. 
If not, please email me, I will send it to you. They, could, they should be in the bottom of the page. So of course they will be different, but the basic idea is the same. So you can consult the old ones and try to form them now. Okay, so if no more questions, then we uh, stop now. And uh, for those who are on Teams or who want to uh, attend here, the uh, practical class will be in 23 minutes. Thank you and goodbye.